Welcome to Conversations with Comedians. I'm your host, Chris Rossetti. Our very special guest today is Taylor Mason. So sit back and relax and get ready to laugh with our very special guest, Taylor Mason. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time of day it is for you, whenever you happen to be watching this broadcast, and welcome to Conversations with Comedians. My name is Chris Rossetti, free to laugh now here in the city of San Francisco, free to laugh now because it was set free from 30 years of depression. I want to encourage anybody suffering from depression, fear, anxiety, or stress of any kind. If I can have a miracle, your miracle could be just around the corner. So welcome in once again to Conversations with Comedians. So let's have some fun. Let's bring our guest in, Taylor Mason, amazing man, very talented, ventriloquist, author, musician, writer, and all around nice guy. Welcome him to the show, everybody. Taylor Mason. Thank you for joining us today. It's so good to see you. Chris, thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thanks to everybody. You know, there, there are miracles happening all the time and all around us. So, you know, you never know. So if you, you are suffering, as Chris said, from depression or stress or just the anxiety that's going on for all of us, good thing you're here because we're going to relieve a little bit of that somehow, some way. And uh, God is good in the end. So thanks for having me on, Chris. I'm thrilled to be here. No problem, Taylor. It's It's been one of my lifelong dreams to have you come into my apartment here in San Francisco. Well, thank you. And just looking around here, uh, I see that for $400,000 a year, you've got about 10 square feet. So good for yeah. you. Good for yeah. you and, and to everyone here in San Francisco. <laughs> Actually, I'm in my I'm in my little office and this decalb sign behind me is that's kind of a reminder of my family uh, had a farm and my uncle and my cousin Matt still run that farm and they they have corn. They, they raise a lot of corn. So that's kind of and the wings that you see coming out of my head right, right now. That's because this thing's going to take off at any moment. Let's start off this conversation before we get to the ventriloquism and the comedy and the writing of of books. Let's get into the topic of music. Tell us about your love for music and were you ever in a band? I, I started piano when I was a little boy. I think uh, I listened to AM radio. My mom heard me. She had a big a piano that she had. In our living room, she had a piano that she had painted green and white. It looked like cotton candy. It looked like a lot of fun anyway. And then listening to AM radio, I think one of the first songs I learned was B a Bee Gees song, uh, Got to Get a Message to You or something. I tried to pick out the notes. And then right after that, I took started taking piano lessons with Mrs. Randall, who is, a, is very sweet. She was one of those people, I'm, a, I'm of a certain age, that, uh, for example, when the movie Wizard of Oz would come on when I was a little boy, it would be in black and white. And then there'd be a moment during the, during the uh, movie where Dorothy gets, gets out of the house and she's in Oz and everything turns into color. And that was kind of like when I walked into uh, Mrs. Randall's house, you would walk into her house and then it was just an explosion of, she had all these little figurines, glass, and they were like prisms. And so light was shining everywhere. And then she had this beat up old upright piano. But it was all kind of a fantasy. It was just an incredible thing as for a little boy. And I would go and learn all my, she had me uh, for one of my recitals, I played Bumble Boogie and I got to do my own ending. And, you know, it was a big moment for me. And uh, in those days, dads didn't go to the recitals. It was just moms. Right. But all the moms came up and, you know, it was like, oh, Oh, I could actually do this. This is something I could actually do and have a lot of fun with. And I was in a band called the Janitors uh, cool. when I was in college. Our gimmick was we would all dress up as if we were janitors. So wearing dungarees. And on the billboard outside, it said, tonight, the janitors. So why nobody ever got this is beyond <laughs> me. And we would always say, uh, yeah. you know, they're going to know that it's us. But we would walk around the bar where people before that, you know, are drinking at the bar or whatever. And we're walking around with a broom and then like the drummer would go up on stage and he's sweeping and then he sees, <laughs> you know, sees the drum and boom, sits down and, boom, 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 boom. 
and then the guitar player would go up and he'd be he'd be listening and he'd put his broom down and would go over and pick up wow and I'd go up and I had this piano player or I was the piano the 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 bass player's dad built a tricked out upright piano and put it on wheels and mic'd it on the inside. Oh wow. Almost like a guitar. And we I mean that thing weighed four thousand pounds. So we would take a van, we wheel that thing in. So I'd sit down at this piano and I'd start playing. Our big our big hit was taking care of business. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Three chords and a lot of shouting. We could yeah. do a 30 minute jam on it. So if you had a 45 minute set that would be 30 minutes of your 45 minute set, play three more songs and we were done with that set. And that was, so that was, uh, I was in college at the time. And then I got a job working as a musical director at the Second City Theater in Chicago. What? Which is where I met my wife there. Really? And this was, and the story there is this, it's a good story. I go to audition to be an actor at the Second City Theater in Chicago. I had taken some, some improvisation classes, but I had no, maybe four. And then they have an open audition, so I go. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea. Improvisation, you know. So I'm uh, sitting in the hallway out in front at the theater, and somebody comes out and says, Mason, and whatever. And this woman and I go in, and there's Del Close, the director. And he says, okay, we're going to start with five through the door. Go back there and do it. And I, I, I look at the woman I'm with, and I said, well, listen, I don't, I don't, do you know what five through the door is? And she says, her eyes, you know, <laughs> you know, and if it's a movie, it's like, ah! And she says, you don't know what five through the door is? And I said, I have no idea what, what I have no idea. And she says, oh, this is going to be awful. You know, great, great. She, this is going to be awful. And I thought she was going to start crying. So she says, well, you're going to start. Just throw, come through this door. I'm on stage. And you come through the door and just uh, start something. So I walk <laughs> through the door. And I walk over to her and I take my arm. This is the first thing I've ever done as a comedian, really. And, and I'm auditioning to be in the Second City Theater. And I take my arm and I put it on the, the bench in front of her. We're improvising. And I say, this doesn't work. <laughs> what? I, this. I bought this yesterday, this arm. And look at it. It's just, it's hanging off my arm. And she's just, so I'm doing, I just keep talking. I want a refund. I want to get a new arm. Can you give me a new arm? Because I, I can't go through life. I thought you guys said that this arm would be replaced and everything would be perfect and look at it, it's, it's worthless. And at that moment, the producer walks in during the, and, she, and says, is Taylor Mason here? So there's three of us in the room, Del Close, the director, me and this actress. And I said, you know, I'm Taylor Mason. She says on your resume here, it says you, you can read, you can sight read? Yes. So I go over to the piano and I play a song. And this is so great, I'll never forget this. I, this sheet music. And the first lyric is, I hate liver, liver makes me quiver, liver makes me curl right up and die. <laughs> and that's, and I look at it and I'm thinking, this is the second city, this is, okay. It's a vamp in E, so I play the song and she says, okay, you're hired. And then she looks at the director, the director looks at her, there's, you can tell there's some tension there. You know, she's interrupted an audition. <laughs> and then I just, what do I do? I, I don't know, I'm, I just came to audition. So I walk into the office with her and I signed a deal and I was a musical director at the Second City a couple of years. That's insane. That's oh, it's a crazy story. And then, so I toured with them. My roommate on the road was Dan Castanoletta, who is the oh. voice of Homer Simpson. Oh my and word. The cast had Julia Louis-Dreyfus was in that cast for a little while. Yeah, and there's an incredible cast of yeah. people who, uh, you know, my wife and I always talk about this. The, the people that we always thought were the most talented are not the people that became stars. And we would talk about, oh, this guy, you know, when we were together, we would say, oh, this is gonna be a star. This, she's so great. There's no way she won't have a sitcom. Right. And, uh, but Bonnie Hunt was somebody we thought was really, really incredible. And she wanted to have a very good career. Sure. So, but that, it, that's how I got started in nice. show business in Chicago. Nice. In the, and, I, and at the same time, I was going to Northwestern University, mm -hmm. getting a master's degree in, at the Medill School of Journalism. At the in, same time. At the same time, it was, my life was pretty much the way it is now, just upside down. Well, so, let me play a clip, okay, of you playing some music with a very special person, okay? Oh, so great. everybody sit back and relax, let's watch this, it's about a minute long. Taylor Mason, the musician, folks, the musician, here it is.
No? No, not yet. All right. He's a good sport. He was a good sport to put up with that. That was incredible. <laughs> and he was he was the one he came up with the, you know, he's he's a very, very talented man. And he said he wanted to do something at the end. And he, his idea was, oh, oh. And he he pretty much in, in 30 seconds he wrote the route that this is what we're gonna do. And you know, okay, wow. John. Oh well, yeah. And he wow. could have and he's a very good musician, you know. Oh he's yeah. Won, he's won Grammys. So I mean he's amazing. He's, Oh yeah, so that was a, that was a thrill to work with him. And he's a very just a great guy. Well, let me ask you now about um, your actual vocal talents, uh, the talents that you have with different voices. And I have to ask you a question and interject something personal real fast. Um, I do voiceover work. I do character voices as well. And I wonder, um, have you ever done like I've done? Have you ever used your character voices, your vocal talents? to try to get out of trouble. For example, you don't have to confess anything. You don't want to be held later, you know, but I've called up people when I was in trouble with, you know, the power bill or something, or, you know, bounced a check over the years. And I would just give it the old, can you help me out? please? Ah. Just, I'm curious. I'm curious. You don't have to confess here publicly, but have you ever been tempted to get out of trouble by using your voice ability? Two, two stories that kind of relate. One is, you know, the robo calls that we all get from, every kind of company you can imagine. My wife has a really good trick. She will answer, hello, is uh, Marcia Mason or Taylor Mason there or Franklin Mason? My full name is Franklin Taylor Mason. You know, is, is Franklin Mason there? And my wife will answer, huh? I'm sorry, it's Franklin Mason. Oh, I don't, I don't. And she makes up some language. <laughs> and it's great because, ma'am, are you are you his wife? I'm um, and she, and she'll, she can sometimes go for three or four minutes and just keep this person on the line until they finally realize that, you know, she just keeps going over and over the top. My favorite thing to do as a ventriloquist and just to have fun with people, I have two. Uh, one is I've done this with people before where we're in a hallway walking. We're in a hotel it's right after a gig. You know, and we, we're back. We're back at the hotel, so it'll be two or three of us. And I'll get to my room, and I'll open my door. And as I walk in, you'll hear, "Hey, oh hi! I didn't know you were here." And people always come around and, and peek in to see who is that. And of course, there's nobody in there. It's me. And the second way I do that is if you're on an elevator. I've done this before, <laughs> where everybody's you know standing around, and I'll do a help me. Did you hear that? Oh, did you get, I've done that a couple of times on elevators and gotten people. To, <laughs> we have a lot of it. people joining in from uh, Facebook, so let's uh, see what they're saying real quick. Okay, Taylor, here we Great. go. We have we have some wonderful people coming in. We have uh, Michelle Van Dusen, very talented comedian, coming in, saying two of her favorites. She's referring to you and Romeo, I'm sure, not me. Oh. Here is uh, here is Tara. Tara is saying hello. Thank Hi, Tara. You for, thank you for joining in. I'm Michelle. And, Jennifer is here today. I promise you, Tara Ingram, we will get down to San Antonio. There you go. And we will rock that city one night. I don't know what venue. We'll, we'll figure it out. If nothing else, we'll try to come in and do a virtual program, kind of the way that Chris and I are doing right now. I'm doing a ton of these right go. now. So we'd love to do that, too. And Ben Wright wants to know, where's the most interesting place you had a show? Besides right here, of course. Okay, Ben, I, I great question. And I've, I've worked every freaking place you can imagine this is there's a there's a theme park in pennsylvania in hershey pennsylvania run by the hershey chocolate company oh yeah and they had me come out one time and it was uh, so a ticketed event right so people are purchasing tickets to see taylor mason at in a small venue and what they did was they were going to have four shows in one afternoon and evening. So I'm doing, a, say, a two o'clock program and then a four o'clock program. 
and then a six o'clock and then a big show at eight. Great, right? And they sold them all out, 250 seats. Great, gonna be a lot of fun. I go out and the gig is underneath a train. So the train, it's one of those trams that, that takes you around the park. So I'm doing my show, playing music, doing ventriloquism, doing stand-up comedy. The crowd is right in front of me. But every, seriously, every 10 to 12 minutes, you know, <laughs> this train would come through. So I would have to, I would be doing my act and I would, and then I'd start again when the train went by. And by the fourth show, I had it nailed. I knew when the train was coming. So I would just do things like I would be working, hitting a punchline and just wait for it. And then I would go back to the punchline. Oh yeah, it was it, it was one of the most bizarre <laughs> jobs. And the thing that was weird was it was a ticketed event. And they had a theater, but they put me underneath the train. Oh well. Unbelievable, unbelievable. So folks, let me remind you, you're watching Conversations with Comedians. Our very special guest today is the very multi-talented Taylor Mason. Taylor, let me ask you a quick question. Um, what's the proper terminology to use for referring to, when referring to your partners in comedy, your partners in ventriloquism? Uh, ventriloquism. I, I don't want, I don't want to say the, the D word, but so what's the proper term? People still use the word dummy. You know, Jay Johnson, the great ventriloquist, tells a great story about the way the word dummy, and I'm going to share it with you because it's a great story. Jay Johnson tells the story uh, that a New York Times reporter, and this was early 1900s, goes to see a, you know, like vaudeville days. It goes to see a performer up in Binghamton, New York at a theater, and the, the Times reporter goes and either is has had a couple before the program or is not, is not completely with what's happening. And the ventriloquist had, say, eight, what they were at the time called automatons, big, large, life-size wooden figures. And I think the scene that he, the ventriloquist did was in a barber shop. And so he would wheel one of these eight big automatons to the front of the stage. And then he, and with the controller, would operate, like think of giant nutcracker, would open and close the, the, the thing's mouth and give it a haircut, moves it back, and then and there were eight of them, okay, over the course of, a, say, a, say, an 80-minute theatrical performance. And the reviewer wrote this. The person who led the program, who played the part of the barber, is a great actor and did a wonderful job. However, the other eight people on stage stood around and acted like dummies. And that is where the word dummy became the universal <laughs> term for a ventriloquist <laughs> partner. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great story. So thank you, Jay Johnson, uh, who's an incredible genius. And you know, at the, in the, the world of ventriloquism, there are maybe five or six people who are at the top. And Jay Johnson is probably, if he's not one, he's one A. He's a great one, and he's he's well worth looking into. He's just a great. But that's a great story, and that's where the word dummy came from. Now, to answer your question, a couple of years ago, I started going to the ventriloquist convention which is a trip and a half. And even if you're not a ventriloquist, it's worth going because the people are amazing. And the degree of separation between the superstar in our business and the beginner is not that big. So there's a good chance when you go to a ventriloquist convention, you're going to meet somebody that you've seen on television or in movies or on YouTube or who has done great things in the, for lack of a better word, we'll call it skill of ventriloquism. And while I was there, what I learned was a lot of people don't refer to their ventriloquist figure as a dummy. I think the preferred term, I think, is character. Uh, you know, for me, inner child, uh, I've, I always thought of myself, we're kind of like a, um, think of Rosencrantz and Gilderstern. I'd be Rosencrantz. My puppet, Romeo, would be Gildenstern in this case. I think muse is another word that mm -hmm. could possibly be, or partner. Yeah, um, whatever. To me, honestly, Chris, these are my imaginary friends who have come to life. That's, Fantastic. That's how I look at it. Well, let me show a couple of clips real quick of some of your imaginary friends in action, shall I? Yeah, please. All right, here we go. Everybody sit back and relax. We're going to take a look at two little clips and then we'll come right back to Taylor. Thank you for joining us, everybody. You're watching Conversations with Comedians. I'm Chris Rossetti in San Francisco, and that is the amazing Taylor Mason. Paco? Mm -hmm. Paco? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. No, not my mascara. What? Achoo. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. It's okay. It's okay. You feeling all right? I think so. Okay. Nobody wants to get sick. Yes, I know. I see you were wearing your mask. You should wear a mask. So I don't get sick? No. You should just wear a mask. Oh, stop it. <laughs> so you want to be just like me? I want to be a ventriloquist. Oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> really? Okay. Try to talk without moving your lips. I need to thought that. Use Romeo. Shut up, man. <laughs> Face forward. Let him try to throw his voice. This is disgusting. Go ahead, buddy. Throw your voice. Hello, my name is Romeo. No, you have to do it without moving your lips. What? Without moving your lips. Hello, my name is Romeo. Oh, that is weird. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> it's amazing. So that leads me to my next question. Did you make Paco, Romeo, and your other companions yourself, or did you purchase them? Here is the, the everybody always asks this. Right. And in my program, I always say that I built the puppets, and which was in the beginning, it's true. And here's, boy, I wish I'd bought a, the way I started was my mom would do the laundry and she would roll socks up into a ball. So if you can imagine a sock ball and the way it works is the socks are laid out straight, they're clean. She rolls them into a ball and twists them, right? So it's a, a sock ball and the opening in one of the socks is at the top. But my mom every day would form that sock ball into a smile. So that opening was a smile. So when you would open your sock drawer in the morning, there were 15 smiling little fuzz balls looking up at you, which is already halfway to an imaginary friend. At the same time that I'm doing that, Sherry Lewis, a very famous ventriloquist, her daughter Mallory still kind of does a tribute to her. And she's, and Sherry Lewis is just another amazing ventriloquist. God rest your soul. But oh, so the sock is already smiling. It's in the drawer. So all it took was I saw this lady on TV with a sock on her hand. So one day I take the sock and put it in my hand. My grandmother was a seamstress at the J.C. Penney in downtown Ottawa, Illinois. And one day, this is back in the day, I'm running around the store driving everybody crazy. But my, and my grandmother takes me to the back upstairs at J.C. Penney to the so where all the, the seamstresses worked. And she said, we're going to make a real puppet for you. And she showed me how to sew buttons for eyes, yarn for hair. And so that's how I got started. And then, you know, you start building your own puppets. And the first puppet that I used was a sock puppet that I just literally, and then my parents bought me, oh my gosh, when I was in grade school, a slot jaw plastic puppet that looked like Danny O'Day, who wow. was, yeah, exactly, from Paul Winchell, uh, this another, these old famous ventriloquists, Jimmy Nelson, Paul Winchell had a huge, obviously, effect on my life. And there was this plastic Danny O'Day my dad brings home, and it was a giant sock with a head and a string in the back of the neck that you would pull down and the slot jaw would open. And I told my dad, this doesn't work, my sock is better, because, <laughs> and my dad says, we're going to rebuild this puppet, and we did. We rebuilt it. So that it had a, we put a joystick in the in the head. We put a doll, think uh, um, yeah. mortar and pestle. Yeah. We, okay, and so turn that upside down, and you and then we attach the string with a thimble. I put my thumb in so I could open and close. And that's so I, the first couple that I used, I either built myself right. or I remodeled. And what a lot of ventriloquists do is, by necessity, <laughs> we become seamstresses and right. we become uh, builders. Another another good story is when I was at Northwestern working in Chicago, I would get these gigs and there was a, a mom and pop pizzeria down on the south side of Chicago that would do a Friday night comedy show. And I would take the, the L, the elevated train from Evanston, Illinois, down into the southern suburbs of Chicago, get off the train and walk to this mom and pop joint to do my, my comedy act. And one night it's pouring rain I've got a wooden headed at the time, a wooden headed slot jaw figure made by a very nice man named Robert Scott. And I'm walking in the rain in the puppet, in the, my figure, my ventriloquist wooden headed figure is in this nylon bag. I get to the gig and you're, you're, you know, I'm late. You're on right away. So I walk on stage, open the bag, water pours out of the nylon bag. <laughs> it, it was as if he had taken a bath. And I pull the guy out, he's wooden, and the jaw, had expanded because of the rain. 
So the jaw, even though I'm yanking on the, the string to open the puppet's mouth, it won't open. So immediately you have to become not only a ventriloquist or puppet builder, you have to become funny on the spot. And of course, there's lots of jokes with the puppet's mouth won't open, it's warped, oh my word. et cetera. So I, I got through, you know, the puppet, oh, are you going to talk like that all night? Oh, you know, this is great. I'm not moving my lips. Look at this. You know, and I, I was doing, so I did probably did a 20 minute performance with my wet. And I remember thinking on the way home, I put the puppet back, the, the wooden figure back in the bag. And I think to myself, I'm going to go back to the soft socks and other. And so I started working with a woman named Verna Finley, very famous ventriloquist builder, God rest her soul, another, just a great lady. And now I work with just geniuses. Wow. A woman named Marianne Taylor, a gentleman named Steve Axtell. Uh, there are these wonderful, I mean, there are so many, there's, I, those are just two of a myriad of people who build and custom build. Uh, Barry Gordimer is another guy. I did a TV commercial for Missouri Farm Bureau Insurance. We did TV, radio, and billboard advertising. And wow. We created a character named Clay, a farmer for Missouri Farm Bureau Insurance, and Barry Gordimer built to spec exactly what this company wanted for the figure to promote their insurance. So uh, now I work with these wonderful people who are far better than I'll ever be at building this. Um, let me ask you a quick question. The uh, stimulus checks we're all hoping to get someday. Um, <laughs> will you receive uh, 500 bucks for each one of your... Um... For my so, figures, uh, yeah, for my, my employees, yeah. right? Yeah, that would be, I think, yeah, I'm sure that the United States government and the great state of New Jersey, where I live, <laughs> would be thrilled to hear, yes, uh, how many employees do you have? Mm, I have about 16 of them. Some of them are part-time, some of them are full-time. Great, yeah. tell me what they do. Well, I stick my hand up their back. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a try. Yes. Okay, and I have you know a quick what? At this point, we'll do anything, right? We'll take whatever we can get. Exactly. Well, first, let me ask you one last question here. Uh, have you ever been caught up in the moment during your fast-paced act and found yourself waiting for Romeo to say something? I mean, I watch you, and it's like so frantic. It's like so crazy. And and I'm like, who's talking next? Do you ever get caught up in it and say to yourself, wait a minute, someone's supposed to be talking here? I'm, I'm just curious if that's ever happened. This is, again, this is lots of more insight than anybody would possibly want to know. The way I see my show, and this was, this was first brought to me by a comedy club owner in Nashville, Tennessee named Brian Dorfman, who kind of liked my act because of the frenetic, insane, what's going on pace. And the, he described it, and I've used, I've used, and here's the cool thing about ventriloquists is a lot of people think of us as loners, you know, these weird people up in the, the, their attic playing with puppets and then they go to a comedy club or a theater or a cruise ship or a church or wherever and they do this program with their imaginary friend and they're a loner. But the truth is, all of us in this business, it's very much like being in a theater group or in a band because you're dependent on sound, tech, lights, writers, puppet builders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Brian Dorfman, a comedy club owner, once told me, that my act reminded him of a Grateful Dead show where nobody really knows, including the band, what are we playing next? What are we doing next? They're all looking around. And I kind of look at it that way. I've just taken it one step. It's almost as if I'm a psychotic Santa Claus. I've got this big bag. Inside the bag are all my imaginary friends who are going to go through all the issues that I've got knocking around in my head. And who are we going to pull out now? And that's how I I kind of see my, my program. So there's, there never really comes a time that I don't know what I'm doing. There are many times when I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what to do next. At the same time I say that, just from the wonderful response we're getting here on, on Facebook, people who come to see my show, the audience kind of leads me through where I'm going to go. I kind of let them lead me uh, as a point of reference. So I don't exactly know where it's going to go and when I when I walk on stage. Yeah. But by the end, I'm, oh, so this tonight's show was about blank because that's what we're giving the audience. Fantastic. Well, let's take a look at some of the comments and then uh, we'll get to the questions. And also, we're going to talk to you about your latest book and yeah. how people can get a hold of you for events. So right. uh, Randy says, hello. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Randy. Chuck is saying, love this interview. We've got some other people coming. David is coming in from Canada. Oh, fantastic. Neighbor of the North. Hello, David. 
Let's see who else is watching from Tennessee. Fantastic. Okay, this person says, I used to have Taylor on gigs and he is great. Oh, uh, this is Chris Raphael. Okay, I've got a great story for it. I got a quick, I have, I've been doing this and I've never had a job. So Chris Raphael is one of those people, very, um, what's the word I would use, eclectic. So he calls and says, I've got a gig for you. Where is it? It's in the Caribbean. And you're going to, it's, you're going to be doing a program for people who are travel planners and they book like these resorts and things. Great. And he says, you're going to be working outdoors at a pool. I'm great with you know, whatever you want, Chris. So he flies me down there. I think it's Tortola. And the gig is great. And he says, oh, you've got an opening act. Oh, who's my opening act? It's this woman named Maxine Nightingale who had a big hit in the 70s. Uh, going to get right back to, well, it's all right. And we're, da, 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 we're going to get right back to where we started from. So Maxine Gale with no band, just karaoke style. And the, the, the audience is around the pool. And she did like 20 minutes on one song. And she walks around, she's singing, dancing with people in the audience. And I'm just mesmerized. I'm just, this woman is just incredible. And I, Chris Raphael comes over and he goes, she's pretty good, huh? And I go, yeah, she's, this is the greatest act I've ever seen. And the place is going crazy. She walks off, unplugs, walks away. And, and Chris goes, now you're on. Oh, oh my gosh. No, oh, you got to be kidding me. And I had to go out and do my act after her. I never get to meet her either. Oh, my word. See, Diane says, hi, Taylor. Diane is from Illinois. So she knows DeKalb. I know Diane. Actually, Diane is kind of like um, my sister from another mother. She's uh, she's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, Mark Harrington says, we've seen you several times in Disney Cruises. Love you. Who's your favorite? Who's your personal favorite character that you have? Well, first, Disney Cruise Line has been, and we are going out again. Mark, we're going, I don't know when, I don't know how they're going to do it, but Disney, I guarantee you we're going to go out. I can't wait to get back on the ships. I love doing those. Disney Cruises are just a lot of fun, and it's, it is just an amazing event. If, you are, if you're a Disney person, the great thing about Disney Cruises is it's a contained Disney World. So you want to meet the cast of Frozen? You will meet. And you will not stand in line for an hour and a half. You'll stand in line for a few minutes. And you'll get to meet Mickey. You'll meet Minnie. You'll take pictures with Goofy. Stitch will be there. They'll, everyone, Lalo, the cast of Mulan. You'll meet all these people. Plus, they, they have shows. And I am blessed because I get to do, uh, up until now, of course, I, I probably am out 25 times a year on Disney cruises. And to answer your question, Mark, I guess my favorite would be Paco. My family, my uncle Art, come full circle now at the beginning of the program. When I was a little boy, my uncle Art raised hogs. Hola, hola. And um, Paco, senor, let's not be mean. We're going to say hello to everybody out there. Hola. And Mark, okay, he asked a question about my favorite figure, imaginary friend. Who do you say? Well, I said it's you. Really? Yep. I love you. Okay. That's awfully nice, but let's not get weird. Okay. Because I was just talking about how weird this is a middle-aged man up in his office playing with puppets. No. Yes. Sit over here. So and Michelle wants to know, have you ever done a hidden camera show with your voice? I have not yet done a hidden camera show with my voice, but I might steal that idea, my, I, that idea from Michelle Van Dusen and, and use it myself. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. And I need ideas. Stuart says, uh, seeing and hearing Taylor always brings back great memories for our family. Stuart, the lawyer from Toronto. Oh, my gosh. And, I, you know, my brother lives in Toronto, lives in East York. And my, I, I went up there one time. Uh, there's a Second City Theater company. <laughs> I remember this. And the Second City Theater in Chicago used an acoustic piano, which, great, right? It's, uh, you can do a lot of stuff with an acoustic piano. And the, the two people who were the musical directors that I was either the backup for or when we went on the road, they didn't come with me. I was the one who went on the road. But Fred Kaz, Genius, and Ruby Streak were just amazing. And they could make a piano sound like an or 88 keys, but they would make it sound like an entire orchestra. They were just brilliant. Toronto, when I went up there, they had taken it to another level. They had the synthesizer at the piano. They weren't and I and I was I remember thinking, wow, I'm from the second city, the original Second City Theater. And these guys are doing stuff that I can't even, it's just blowing my mind. So yeah, I, I always love coming up to Toronto. Stuart, thanks, Stuart. Fantastic. Now I have a question that's gonna lead into uh, my next question. Uh, Levi Rednauer says, hey Taylor, one funny man, 
I've never had stories make me double over and roar like the ones from your book. Oh man, thank you, Levi. Yeah, Levi just hit with, I just met Levi online and I know he bought my book and uh, I've written two books. The first book I wrote was about uh, a how-to ventriloquism and it's available as an ebook. And this is not a promotion because I don't make a penny. My deal with Penguin Publishing was I would write the book and then I would, they gave me a check in advance that believe me when I tell you that was already spent, that's gone. Uh, for example, my youngest kid is at Columbia University in New York City, it's an Ivy League school. And just full disclosure, we did not make our kid join the rowing team. We didn't buy a <laughs> building, anything like that. They got in on something called uh, Merit. But my first book, uh, A Complete Idiot's Guide to Ventriloquism is available as an ebook only now. I'll, I'll, I get a lot to this day. I get a lot of positive feedback about it. It's not about how to build your ventriloquist figure. There are tons of books about that. My book is about how to make all the sounds to make a, a ventriloquist figure character come to life, how to write dialogue, how to set up your performance, how to work A to Z as a professional ventriloquist. So that was our first book. And I, the book that just came out is called uh, Irreversible. I'm very proud of it. It's kind of my life story. Some of the stories I've told here are in there. Some of the stories I've told here are not in there. So again, I'm not making a ton of money on this book. I make a dollar, I think, per sale. But the ebook is only about $3. It's Google Play, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. It's gotten a ton of five-star reviews, especially on Goodreads and Amazon. So if you're enjoying what I'm doing here today, I know you'll love the book. It's a fast read, about 325 pages or something. And it just describes my whole career, kind of what we're talking about here tonight, but in a lot more detail. So that, that book is the one you're seeing right now on your screen, everybody. Make sure you go to Amazon and order your copy today. Uh, Taylor, I'll use my announcer voice for you if you don't mind. Go, go for it. I love that. Taylor Mason's latest book, Irreversible, available on Amazon. Order your copy today. Taylor Mason's Irreversible traces the life of a ventriloquist. From the moment he discovered that a talking sock on his hand made someone laugh, to winning television variety competitions, to performing on the biggest stages with some of today's biggest stars. It's a story of perseverance, hard work, and the sheer joy of doing what one loves. That's Irreversible by Taylor Mason. Get yours now. Oh, I man, I got to hire you, bro. That's great. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, everybody. You're watching Conversations with Comedians. I'm Chris Rossetti in San Francisco. This is Taylor Mason, stuck in a bunker in New Jersey. Love All right, it, here, man. here we have some more questions. This is from Eric. Have you ever gotten back to give a pep talk to your university football team? Ah, uh, Yeah, I played college football for the University of Illinois. There's a really good chance that I was the worst player on the worst team in the history of college football many, many decades ago. Uh, you know, I have not been back, invited back a couple of times to take part in the spring game where even old guys like me who had graduated would come back, actually put on a uniform and go out and pretend to play. And there's no way that, there's just no way I would do that. Um, my favorite story from the University of Illinois, when I was a, I was not, I was not recruited. I was what's called a walk-on. What is a walk-on? A walk-on is a player that was not recruited, was not asked to come and play on the team, was not needed, was not wanted, and yet shows up the first day as if he's one of the guys. And they are, they think, well, what the heck, we'll, we'll use him for fodder, which is basically what I was. And the first time that I actually put on pads, I, I, looked, I, I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, not only do I not look like a college football player, there is no way I am. And I'm shaking in my boots and I walk out and do it stretches. And the first thing they do is these, these drills where they, I'm playing defensive line, which is I'm, I'm microscopically small. One guy on that team used to call me the fighting fetus. I mean, I was just so much smaller than everybody, but they've got me holding a big tackling dummy thing. And they're having offensive linemen sprint at me and just throw their bodies into me. And this, this humongous creature named Revi Sori, who later played on the Chicago Bears and was blocking for Walter Payton, one of the greatest running backs in history, this guy comes at me and it was like a Wile E. Coyote movie. He just flattens me. Boom. I go down. You know, it wasn't even like he, he just ran over. I was pancaked, literally, like laying on the ground, stars going around my head. 
and I'm, I'm just, I'm desperately miserable and coaches are yelling at me. So I'm thinking next time I'm not putting up with this. So next time here he comes, he's sprinting and I've got the, but this time instead of letting him hit me, I like run at him a little bit. So we collide and he just, he still runs over me, but he falls down. So Revy Sori is on the ground. He tripped basically and fell down. And I'm thinking, I just knocked down Revy Sori. I think I can play. So for the next five years, I tried to play college football. And when I got into games, it was a miracle, which is kind of what we were talking about when this whole thing started. So thanks, Eric, for asking me. Exactly. Okay, uh, listen, we're almost done. What's the easiest way for corporations, churches, and individuals to reach out for you for a performance? What's the best way God for people you. to get hold of you? You know, uh, taylormason.com, NFP. I've been doing a lot of virtual programs just like this, uh, comedy shows for a bunch of companies, uh, press metal, uh, in-store digital audio networks. I just did one for ProQuest. So if you're interested, uh, or, you know, I've done, I'm doing schools. I've just done a bunch of these virtual shows. Go to taylormason.com. And I'll throw this in too right now, just as a plug. If you will book me for 2021, I will do one of these virtual shows and we'll make a deal with you. We'll do a couple hundred bucks, $250. And I'll come and do a program for whoever. I just did a Concordia Senior Citizen Center Last night, it was a lot of fun. They were a great time. So I've done a few corporations, a couple schools, uh, a senior citizen center and a church. And I'm doing another one on Sunday. So um, I love doing these. And I, we will give you, Tim Grable, who's my partner, we'll give you a break if you want to book us. Fantastic. TaylorMason.com. Go there for all your entertainment needs. Very funny, man. Taylor, thank you so much for being with us today. I appreciate it so much. Thanks so much, Chris. See you next time. I don't think they can hear us. They can't hear us? I don't think so. Dollar? No, it doesn't mean it's over. There, there's a glitch in the whole thing. Hey, guys. Hey, everyone. It's Chris. <laughs> All right, which one of you guys unplugged my cable? Don't look at me. Thank you for watching Conversations with Comedians. We'll see you next time. <laughs>